All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's always hard to come just before lunch and give you a talk on technology, you know. So we'll try to keep it short and sweet so that you know you all get what you're looking for, and also we're going to showcase our experiences as well. I'm Latif Saeed. I'm head of analytics uh, in Verizon. I've uh, been with Verizon for uh, 17 plus years right now, uh, doing a lot of innovation and uh, you know AML uh, work. Uh, very exciting. A lot of things has transformed the last many years. So we will showcase uh, what we have done from a call center standpoint. As a follow-up, uh, my colleague here, Jalal Ali, would also come in and share uh, his experience on how we have leveraged Spark and what we have solved for in certain use cases in our call center operations. Sounds good? Jalal, you want to? No, go ahead. OK. So um, yeah, that's us. Again, uh, Jalal is our fellow uh, leading all the big data analytics from Verizon side. So. Um, Little bit of uh, Verizon. How many Verizon folks are here? All right, I see a few. Okay, so I'll just take a few moments to uh, highlight, you know, what we do. Right. So we are the number one largest telecom in U.S. and in global, and also we have uh, about 131 billion dollars in revenue we generate, uh, which comes with large volume of subscribers. Right. Uh, we have about 145,000 employees that we support. Uh, across the business, both consumer business, wireless, wireline. Uh, we have about 118 million subscribers overall. So with that comes all the complexity that we want to solve for our end user experience. Uh, and then we also have uh, best of network, right, with 98% coverage across the nation and globally as well. On the wireline side, we do have uh, Fios as our business, where we uh, harness into all the internet-based um, services, whether it's um, you know, TV or internet or data usage and so on and so forth. And we also have a larger presence in enterprise services, right? We have a bigger team that supports, supports enterprise solutions, and that is basically caters for more than 99% of big companies like IBM and Plus. So today's agenda will cover uh, in four parts. I will start with, you know, uh, what has changed in Verizon the last few years in regards to big data. And also we'll talk about you know, what we have done to leverage this high velocity of data that is coming in and what use cases we have enabled. So that would be the first part from how we have reduced the overall average call handle time in our call centers. And the second part of it would be more on how we have reduced the overall uh, call volume that is coming into our call centers because we generate about 40 million calls a year, and there is a lot more pressure on us as an organization. How do we take that cost? So Jalal will come and present what we have done in that space using AI ML, and how are the technologies that we have uh, enhanced and further uh, for that needs. A challenging big data landscape. Uh, this slide should be familiar to most of you. There's nothing new. We have seen, as the data has been harnessed, a lot of data has been produced in the many years uh, in the past. And that has not slowed down, right? Every year we see large and large volume of data is coming through. And not only high volume, you all know the five Vs of big data, right? Velocity, volume, variety, veracity, and also the value, right? So all these five Vs put a lot of pressure on the companies. How do we leverage this data and go about it? Right? We have a similar challenge at Verizon as well. We have a lot of real-time data that is coming in from our digital endpoints. We have data coming in from our setup boxes for video. We have data points coming from IoT devices. We have data points coming from point of sale. So you just name it, right? Whether it's high volume of data with variety, structured, unstructured, blob, all those things comes in. And our duty uh, in our organization is how to harness this data and make value out of it. And this is where it becomes challenging because now you have to go and not only gather the data, access it, uh, put some value around it, and generate the insights so we can build some meaningful experience for our customers. And this also calls for self-service needs, right? A lot of business users on marketing, operations, finance, they look for how can we get 
our hands on to this data that is meaningful and how we can leverage this for our own uh, internal needs as well. One thing we always miss is the cost and the hidden debt. What I mean by that, oftentimes CIOs come in and invest a lot of money in the infrastructure to make it like, whether it's digital transformation, whether it's AI ML, whether it is you know, bringing up a lot of value from the data science standpoint, there is a hidden cost, millions of dollars. How do we make this an ROI that can help the company to invest further and we take this cost out so it not only helps the uh, business, but also reduces our bottom line. So that is something we always look from our standpoint as an uh, analytics organization, what value we can produce, and how do we take this and apply it with best practices so we reduce the cost and also at the same time produce more value. So we had our fair uh, challenges as well in Verizon. Uh, we saw we saw some of them using some of the technologies that is listed here. Uh, for high data volume, we do have a Hadoop ecosystem uh, from Hortonworks. And then we also have uh, unified data models that we built on top of our data set. What I mean by that is, as we have structured data and structured data coming in, you have to have governance. No governance, no use. So that is what we applied on our variety of data sources and also building a KPI store on top so that you cater to your top line growth through your KPIs. At the same time, for your research and development, you can use uh, other tool sets using UDM and others that you can leverage for big data, AI, ML capabilities. And from real-time aspect, we did leverage Kafka, Storm, NiFi, and Stream Analytics. It's a combination of different uh, tool sets and we put to use so that we can solve for that as well. Uh, from a data access and reuse, we definitely use the hybrid architecture, uh, the Lambda architecture we'll talk to you about. Uh, Self-service needs, as I mentioned, building that governance and having the data ready for the end users is very critical. So we solved it through a couple of tools that we'll go through. Uh, Kaivos is one example that we leveraged as well. And in order to solve for cost, and, uh, cost around hidden system debt, we made sure the computer is local so that we cater for all the users and all the business uh, teams as well. Okay, um, I think most of you attended the keynote. As Ali was pointing out this morning, Lambda is the game in town, right? Because you have batch data for historical needs, you do have a real-time data needs for your streaming, and we did the same thing as a best practice at Verizon. So on the left, you have all variety of data sources that are coming in. And then we fork it in a way that can serve for different needs, right? For batch, we have uh, ingestion layer coming through Kafka uh, and also through our traditional feeds. And for real time, we have the same thing uh, orchestrated through NiFi and pushing it to the Hadoop ecosystem. And the outcome is basically, uh, you know, you serve for your business needs or likewise we serve for our business teams as well, marketing, operations, content, and so on. So I'll walk you through a use case where we have to solve for a particular problem. The problem is I have thousands of associates in my call centers, and they are handling calls on a daily basis, hourly basis, minute by minute basis. Every call takes in about 25 minutes, and every minute costs us two and a half dollars. So you do the math. 40 million calls a year, $200 per minute, and the rep is spending 20 minutes on the call with the customer, and we have thousands of reps. Easily it runs to hundreds of millions of dollars in a year as a challenge, and in some cases more than that. So what we uh, did was we sat with our business teams, tried to understand how do we solve this problem. Our ultimate end goal is to reduce the average handle time from 25 minutes, even if you get to 20 minutes or 15 minutes, it's gonna be a huge leap for our uh, benefits, right? So the way we started, we start gathering the data across all channels, whether it's assisted channel, digital channel, uh, different devices that we have, just to understand what is happening with the customer, right? What kind of touch points the customer is doing. And then that data flows through our NIFI workflow manager, 
comes in through uh, all the orchestration, whether it's Kafka or others. And then we take that data, push it through our UDM and the KPA store that I was referring to. A unified model that we had that takes data from call centers, takes the data from IVR, takes the data from call routing perspective, brings all this data, transforms the data in real time, and then gives the outcome of what each of those strands mean in terms of customer DNA or in terms of associates. Then we take that data, apply our AI ML technology on top, run some algorithms to see, can I shave off some of those seconds from my call? Is there an opportunity where a customer is looking for certain things and those things can be facilitated for the associates? And that is the uh, approach we took. All the data goes to Hive, runs on top of Presto, and then leverage the elastic search for you know, a Lambda architecture and push those insights back into our frontline systems so that the rep understands what the customer is looking for so that they don't have to go through multiple hops, you know, avoid certain scenarios, and go directly to the question what the customer is asking from content standpoint or from other uh, support standpoint. Uh, from a stream standpoint, right, we start gathering all the data. The streams of data comes through our Kafka layer. Of course, we have scoop, log, stash, pick, uh, pick, and all those combinations that we do. Uh, the primarily, the key thing to understand here is how we leveraged the traditional batch for historical understanding and the real-time batch to make actions. If you, if you notice on the, in the rightmost uh, uh, slide, you see the pros and cons, right? With batch data, which is traditional approach, we definitely get high accuracy. We definitely uh, have less complexity involved. And we also um, have a lot of things that we can do from insights generation. However, it is slow. And of course, in times, you know, you take a couple of hours to generate those and so on. But the trade-off is it is highly accurate, right? When you go to streams, we have a challenge of making it more uh, you know, viable for the end user solution, where we want to take actions immediately. So the accuracy is there, but the complexity is also very high, right? And of course, it has lower latency, which is what we want to use for our use case. And um, from an SLA standpoint, less than a few seconds is the SLA, because imagine when the associate rep is on the call with the customer, they can't wait for hours or minutes. The decisions have to be made in fraction of seconds. So the thought process here is how do we enable those insights, whether it's a recommendation, whether it is uh, content, or whether it's support, those things, how we can bubble it up for quicker insights. And that is what we uh, leverage these streams for. So this example, as I mentioned, this entire bar that you see is the entire call segment, a time segment of the call. A call starts. From IVR, the call comes in, routes it through the uh, different uh, routing channel that we have. It goes to a sales or service rep. And once it hits the desktop, now the rep has the ability to act on it. So what our model does, leveraging all the big data framework that we just shared, looks at the pattern of the calls, looks at the different aspects of the customer, what situation, what life cycle they're in with their products and services, based on their previous past behaviors. Did they come through a digital channel? Did they come through an assisted channel or through their devices and so on? Get, gathers all this data together and then runs a model in real time and inference it saying, is there a likelihood that this call might go beyond the threshold that we have set for? For example, a customer coming in with seven family members having devices all across and now he wants to understand a couple of devices are not working. So this example can be uh, bypassed if you know the insights ahead of time, and the customer calls in looking at the real-time data, what's happening in their premise, and applying that logic, and the model is giving us an output in terms of, yes, this is related to a service issue in their set-top box in their home where they cannot watch TV anymore. So that allows the rep to prepare the insights immediately or get the insights immediately from the platform and have that conversation in that regards rather than going through all the other Q&As that they have to go through. So the model that we built uh, basically predicts that, looks at different insights, and then within the first five minutes of the call, 
it does accurately points out whether this call is going to go beyond the threshold of, say, 20 or 25 minutes. If so, what is the reason? And those insights get pushed back into our frontline system. So now the rep understands where the questions are coming from, what to expect. Very proactive, right? We don't want to be very reactive in terms of uh, to guess for answers or guess for questions. So this applies uh, in the front line, and they are able to make uh, decisions accordingly. So the call segment that you see in here, the first flag is when the call gets started, the model gets kicked in, right? And then after the second one that you see is where it predicts, saying at this point, based on all the information we have gathered, based on the behavior of the rep, based on the skill sets of the rep, this call is most likely is going to go beyond the threshold that we have. It's very powerful. Right? And if you imagine, if you look at all the calls that are coming in during the same time, we have thousands of reps handling different types of customers. And for each and every call, we can predict and say, this call is going to go high. Take these actions, one, two, three, so that now you can slice this call instead of 25 minutes to, say, 18 minutes or so. So that's what we did. So we brought it to life uh, in front of the associates. And it also helped to. Uh, pinpoint some of the uh, challenges we had within our operations, right? Some systems are outdated, not working in a way that it should respond to some of the questions and so on. So uh, in real time, we also used to monitor the inference of the model, which is very important. Because putting a model out with 70% accuracy is one. But if you're not inferencing the model, not trying to see how the model is performing, number one, and what is the ROI or value I'm creating out of it is very fundamental for any um, data science work. So here is the dashboard that we built uh, on top of uh, the data set that we're collecting and pushing to the front, front line. So the stack bars that you see on the left is primarily number of calls that got generated during that time segment. Uh, this gets refreshed every sub seconds. So this is probably um, you know, within the two minutes window how many calls we generated and so on. So 276 calls, 80 calls, uh, I mean, 80 different agents are handling those calls. Eight minutes to nine seconds is what the uh, total time segment is. And the 14 minutes, 26 seconds is the actual AHT. So if you look at the right to, um, sorry. Yeah. If you look at the uh, two boxes on the right, 48 calls went above AHT, and we predicted 31 calls. That is a very good accuracy rate. So what it means is now we are in a position where we can look at all our calls that are coming in and make a decision which calls can go longer or shorter based on the insights we generate. And as and when you are shaving off that time segment from each and every call, now you have a vacuum that you have created where you can take more calls coming in rather than customers dropping off from their queue or having challenges with getting to the right agent or whatnot. Um, and also, these charts at the bottom show um, how many calls we are predicting by time segment and what is the accuracy uh, to further enhance it because oftentimes we want to be more um, you know, sensitive to what exactly is happening within that particular call segment. We expand that input and also look into what are the few components within that call is causing that call to go high or low right, in terms of threshold or timeline. So it allows um, the end user to look at the path, how the call got generated, what is the traversing path the customer has taken, what are all the things that rep is looking at to serve for this particular call need. So that is something we built, and um, the good thing is we are able to shave off about, I would say, um, average six minutes on each call, uh, and it's, it sums out to about $30 million in savings. So with that, um, that's my talk. I want to invite uh, Mr. Jalal here uh, to talk about the next use case. And uh, we'll be here for any questions from that point. Thank you. Thank you, Latif. So next, I will show you how we build a very large scale model with 100,000 features to predict who will call us, why they will call us, and when they will call us. I will walk you through the uh, life cycle of building the model, starting from the problem definition, looking into transactions that causing the customer to call us, doing the data engineering, how we aggregated the data from 
transactions to accounts, and then building the model, uh, train and building the model from our side, and finally deploy the model for the real time. So every, all of this started with a simple analysis we, we did first. We, what we noticed that the higher the number of transactions we did for a customer, changes to their records, changes to their products, the higher that the next month calls are higher. So the, to the left, as you see here, the blue bars are the average number of transactions per month we do for the customers, and the line is the number of calls that they're calling us. So the question is, who will call us? Because we do a huge number of transactions, like 20 million a month, and what products are causing the transaction we have 10,000 products, and we have 100,000 combination of product changes we do the customer. So which product changes specifically are triggering the customer to call us? And who will call us next from the customers? And can we proactively address those customers when they call us so that we'll not uh, save ourselves the next time uh, repeat calls from those customers? So in Telco, if you notice, anything you do for the customer, it will end up of changing the customer profile, adding products to the customer, or removing products from the customer profile. Sometimes these are initiated by the company, by Verizon, doing like price up or contract uh, expiry or promo roll off of offers. And sometimes it's initiated by the customer calling us to the call center or going online and change their profile. When they do these changes, it ends up adding or removing products to their profile. But within 30 days, when we, we, when we run the bill for the customer and the customer see the bill, then the customer will call us. So we initially, historically, what we've been doing in our side, we're looking at the bill changes, how the bill changes correlated with the customer calling us. But now we're going one step before, 30 days earlier, to see the transaction changes, how they impact customer to call us. So we, save our, we have at least 30 days to proactively address the customer needs before the customer calling us. And from data engineering, what we have done here from our side is we started from the transaction. This is a, a transactions for accounts and orders and all the products that we add and drop. Then we map these transactions and aggregate it at the customer level. What you see here, we, we aggregate it at the transaction type and the product. So for each customer, we have a row, and we see which customer will call us. And we did this with a simple command from a Spark, which is the uh, collect list, and it's if we do it in different languages or different data work, uh, databases or SQL, it may take longer time, but here is simple and handy. Not only that, we were thinking that we shouldn't look for a customer adding a discount or removing a discount is the customer will call me, because sometimes, let's say if you remove a discount for $30, will the customer call me or not? It depends if I replace this $30 discount with $10 discount, customer will not be happy, his bill will increase by $20. By $20. However, if I replace this discount of $30 with a $50 discount, then the customer will not call me, will be happy, will be happy in this scenario. So we also added into our features here the products. We have 10,000 products, and we added the combinations of the products, the pairs of the products around 90,000 combination. So now I have 1.4 million customers, I have 100,000 features, and then we start applying on it the model from our side. This is the model results, as you see here. We use ElasticNet. We tried logistic regression, Reg, Lasso. For logistic regression, if you notice, there's a big difference between the training and the testing results. There's around 10%. Same thing for Reg. The reason for that, because the overfitting happened between logistic regression and Reg. Lasso is the best performer here because by definition, Lasso is, is, very, is the best performing Lasso when you have sparse data. We're talking here on 1.5 million customers, 100,000 features, but each customer may have just 30, 40 change, uh, columns there in the 100,000 features. This is very sparse data. Lasso outperform, you have less difference between the training and testing. You have the best testing results. And in addition to that, uh, Lasso has a, a very nice feature. It's also Lasso does a feature subset selection. It shrinks the features from 100,000. It shrinks the features for the most important thousand features with, for us. So to the right, you see that we have the most important features, the ones that indicate that the customer will not call us, 
the blue ones, and the orange ones are the ones that indicate that the customer will call us. So next step, what we did is working with the subject matter expert, saying why these two transactions, in installing this product and installing this product together, are so important for the customer that the customer is calling me. And the next step of it is translate these products, you cannot, these products into what is the action we need to do. It has to be actionable. And what the message I want to show to the customer or to the representative who is talking to the customer when the customer calls so proactively we can address why the customer is calling us. And then we took this to production by integrating it with our digital and assisted channels. First, when a customer calling me, if I know that this, there's higher probability that this customer will call us, what we will do in this scenario, we will, we will have the right message and we will route the customer to the right traps who can address that type of errors and issues that we have addressed from the products changes that we did here. And also, as the customer is talking to the app, once they place an order, we score that order, and we, from that order we know what's the probability that this customer within 30 days will call us again, and which product changes specifically within the last transaction cause the customer to call us, and what message we want the rep to communicate to the customer and tell the customer so that the customer will not call me again. And we tested here with sample orders. As you see some orders here, we'll see that once the order is placed, we have high probability, up, some of them up to 93% that the customer will call me in the next 30 days, or the customer may not call me. And if we double click on this, each one of those transactions, we can know which specifically which product specifically caused the customer to call us and why they're calling us in the next one. After developing this model, as you see here, in general what we have done, we started from customer transactions that historically for years I've been chasing this problem, trying to solve it with R or SAS. I was not able to solve it because of the scale of the data we have. We're talking about 1.5 million, 100,000 product. But with Spark, it's scalable. We're able to solve it. And we were able to identify the call, uh, the drivers. And using Lasso is a good choice here because the data is, is, is uh, the data is sparse data we have, is very big data. And also it helped us to shrink the data and select the best features to run this. We learned from this one. So we will start ap applying the same methodology here in other areas. Think about device alarms that we have today. We have millions of a set of boxes that generate alarms that we can detect for based on the alarms which set of box will fail. So we can proactively know how to communicate to the customer when the customer call us if we predict that this set of box will fail later based on the alarms coming from the uh, devices. And there are other use cases we're planning to use the same methodology we have used this. With this, we're open for questions. And we have 10 minutes here for any questions from the audience. We have mics right here on this side and this side, if you want to come up and ask a question. Um, so I'm curious what the uh, reception was from the people within the call center. Were they very open to having this new technology, or did they fight back and like disagree with what it was telling them to do? Sorry. It's a very good question, right? We always have this challenge uh, in terms of how do we uh, make this friendly? And also, how do we get to the adoption? Um, one critical thing yeah. we did when we started was uh, we started having friendlies or focus groups where we open up the solution for them. And then that helped us to course correct some of the things that we are trying to uh, apply it from technology standpoint, also from recommendation standpoint. Um, so it took a while for us to get that learning incorporated into our solution and bring it back uh, to the frontline uh, systems. So it was not easy. Yeah, definitely it was uh, some challenges there. But when they saw the ease uh, in terms of how the insights are helping them you know, with a click of a button, uh, then they started adopting more. And, and, and it was very successful from that point. We started with 400 reps to start with from a friendly standpoint across the nation. And then we rolled out to thousands of them uh, from that. 
from that uh, juncture. Yeah, to add to this uh, early lesson we learned that you don't go to the Arab and say product A, product B. You have to translate this into language that the Arab understands. So you have to translate from a situation to solution and what's the right message. Sometimes it's not direct, the message there. What message the rep has to say or the rep has to communicate to the customer? Yes, sir. As, so it's kind of a two-fold question. As you started to ramp up and see success, I would imagine that different departments would start to, hey, how can you help us with and find solutions? So as a team, how do you prioritize? And then two, how do you scale? Meaning. It's analytics under one branch, and then you take on projects based on ROI expectation, or do you have kind of analytics as one branch, and you kind of have a matrix organization where you have sub different teams that then decide what priorities they take on? Yeah, thank you. The first part is uh, we do have prioritization in terms of which projects we have to knock off, given we have our monetization that we had to create, right? So call volume reduction was a bigger lever for us uh, last year and the year before that because we want to reduce that calls uh, in tens of millions rather than what we were at. So that helped us to look from that angle, look, looking at all the calls, whether it's sales, service, and whatnot, and go in that aspect. So even if you start tweaking uh, you know, some of the um, you know, initiatives that we have, we should get a broader benefit. Uh, to going back to your second question, um, we do have a hub and spoke model uh, where we have a pool of data scientists sitting together along with the analytics team and also helping the various facets of business, whether it's marketing or operations and whatnot. Uh, in that way, it is more like cohesive and a collective environment uh, because everybody looks at the problem in the same way. And then we prioritize within which one would get us faster, even though the value could be less or which one could take longer, but the value or the ROI would be higher. So that decision is made in that panel, uh, and the pool of uh, data science and the analytics uh, team that we have basically work from that conduit perspective as I have been spoke. Good question, yeah. I have one question. Yes, sir. Could you give me some insight into the type of um, variables that you use in the initial part of the presentation? So the reason why I'm asking this is because I would imagine at different points um, of the customer calling, different touch points, they may have different experiences and you may update that prediction for where, what the AHT is expected to be. Correct. So that means that you would have variables that may be transactional and you would have variables that may be, and would depend upon what, what touch point they're, they're at and you would also have variables that, that depends upon, that are static, so to speak. So um, just some insight into what type of variables um, drove the model. Yeah, actually there are many variables that played in the, uh, in the equation or the solution, I would say. Um, let's take this scenario. The rep has nothing before the solution. They had various screens they had to jump to understand what the customer is calling about or the product and whatnot. Uh, with the collective broader team, after this solution was introduced, we were able to build something called rep guidance, which is like associates who can follow simple steps to get to the insights, right? If a customer is calling about products, they will know exactly what products they are looking into, where they have challenges, whether it's product uh, price or service or billing, whatnot. If it is related to the devices, what challenges they have with the devices, those insights were aligned in that rep guidance uh, flow so the rep doesn't have to go and look into different uh, data. Now, going back to the question, what variables do we use? So it's everything, right? From products, offers, life cycle of the customer, the devices they have at home, what kind of error logs the devices are emitting. So all this went into the mix to bring those insights out, right? And making it more easier for the rep to read so that that customer experience as the endpoint that we can enhance is what our ultimate goal was along with building the models. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, well, I wonder if you'd mind selling this to uh, Comcast because they are lousy, of course. But anyway, no, my, my question, um, of the five Vs you mentioned, which one um, do, would you say you spent, was the most difficult to solve? for in this solution? Of, of the all the five Vs, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, the fifth V is the most challenging one, and this across all the analytics team, right? I, I can vouch on it. The fifth V is the value creation, right? Everything else can be solved by technology, but if we cannot solve for what value we can create out of analytics, then no matter how, how much we spend in terms of dollars or time, uh, that quantification just comes and bites us end of the year. So uh, that has been always the challenge. So this is where we pick the right use cases that are viable, number one, and that are doable in time. You know, uh, having solving for that five V, all the four Vs have to work together, in my opinion. Yeah. Yes, sir. And we will talk to Comcast as well without revealing the secret sauce. <laughs> so um, in the course of the second project, um, you saw the interaction between products that led to a uh, higher likelihood of having calls. Is there any kind of feedback loop that you implemented? Because it seems like your inter intervention was at the stage of, like the call already happened, and then you're giving information to the, the person fielding the call to improve the customer experience at the call point. But is, did you ever feedback your findings into like a product improvement? Like we shouldn't do these two transactions at the same time because for sure it's going to lead to a call in the future. That's where we started. Started saying, look, we're, our statistics analysis shows that these product changes are the highest driver for calls. Why? Can we do something? Can we change something? Can we look into the ROI here, looking into the cost of the call versus the revenue we're getting from this change? Does it justify? If I know that for sure they will call me in the next 30 days, cost me tenders every call, it does it justify the revenue I'm getting from that one? That's where we started. I have a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. This will just be the last question. Sorry. Oh. Yours. No, yours is. Yours is, your, yours is the last one. Yeah. OK, good. Uh, just a little bit of like a technical aspect. Um, so you have streaming option, and then you have batch mode, because from what I see, the model, the way it works, somebody calls you, get the signal, it's streaming, it's analyzed, but then you have to go back and look at the batch data to actually see, okay, this is the plan they have, this is, how do you work, like from the, how do you combine streaming and batch mode at the thank same time? Yeah, like, thank you, I think I missed in my talk track, thank you for bringing that up. When we build a model and train the model, we look at two things. Number one, the time, and the recency of it. So how the batch and the real time work together. For example, if the calls are coming and I'm analyzing for Tuesday, we look at the historical data for Tuesday or Tuesday, and for that time segment. If it is between 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., we lock on that time segment and understand what's happening uh, in this call segment for the over the period of time. Then we take that, input, apply it on the real time, and then this is where the real time aspect kicks in and says, yeah, based on this trend, what we are seeing, most likelihood the, uh, the moms who are calling, they have free time during the Tuesday at 3 p.m., and this is where we're seeing a lot of customers interacting for certain uh, reasons, and that insights gets pushed out to the uh, front line. So likewise, it's a combination of both uh, batch and real time, Real time cannot work without batch, and batch cannot work without real time. That is my take, and uh, this we have seen in real time experience that you know this is something has to work in conjunction to solve for any problem. So when the model looks at it, it looks at the real time and also looks at the historical data, so the inference can be uh, made in real time. And it's in Spark, right? It's all Spark. Yeah, it's all Spark. By the way. I have a uh, lot of data engineers from Verizon here, one standing over there. So if you have any technical questions, please uh, you know, reach out to them. They would be happy to uh, walk you through in terms of how we solved it. A lot of effort has went in. Uh, it's not an easy thing. We flipped it in two months or something. It took a while for us to get through. And also, I want to mention that we are going on uh, Databricks uh, POC. And uh, we've been through training with uh, Databricks. Uh, it's awesome product. If yeah, we need guys, a proof of concept, and we're trying to uh, get that in real time as well. Yeah. yeah. If you guys have any additional questions, um, we can take it in the back. Um, but this ends the session. Um, please don't forget to rate and review the session on the Spark Summit um, app. Thank you. All right. Thank you.